Hello everybody, Taz here. Um, today we've got part two of the interview on the Aztec Conquest with user 400 rabbits. Um, but before we get into that, I just thought I'd talk a little bit about what we've got um, in weeks ahead on the show. I've recorded interviews on the Spanish Civil War, on Japanese pirates. I've got another one lined up on the military aspects of the Vietnam War. Um, and we've also got a, an episode recorded by Algernon Asimov uh, dealing with a very popular question we get of, you know, how did we decide that it was going to be the year that, that today is the in year 2014? Uh, I've also got some other sort of shows in, in my back pocket a bit. But as you can see, there's no sort of, I don't really follow a theme. Um, generally, I, I do what, um, it's based on which users are available to be interviewed. Um, but if you've got any particular areas of history that you're interested in, or any users on Ask Historians that you'd love to see interviewed, shoot me a message, let me know. Um, might be a bit of encouragement for people. One thing that I've found with um, virtually everybody that I've contacted to be interviewed on the podcast is is a surprise that, really, me? And it's, it's quite funny. Um, but yes, generally, uh, any, any flared users who are listening, yes, you are interesting, and yes, I do want you on the podcast. Um, so, yes, I'll we'll go to the the rest of the interview now um we'll jump in in the immediate aftermath i think of uh, 400 rabbits his dog knocked his bike over or something in the background so um yes we'll, we'll start there eh? welcome to the ask historians podcast okay so we are back so uh entering the causeways of tenochtitlan yeah so in early november cortez uh is greeted warmly by uh uh, uh, Motegzuma meeting him on the causeway into Tenochtitlan, and both accounts say that this was very kind of a, a like a warm and friendly greeting on both sides. And <laughs> sorry, you've got something sorry. going on in the background there. <laughs> sorry, I put my dog in my room, and he managed to escape because apparently he's learned how to use doorknobs. Um, <laughs> but excellent, he, sh he should be fine. All right. So yeah, so uh, uh, Cortez is greeted warmly on the causeway by Motegzuma. And uh, and there's a little bit of a different uh, account here as well. So the uh, native accounts say that you know Cortez you know greeted him warmly, gave him a bow, and then looked him directly in the eye to show Cortez that it was okay for Cortez to look at him in the face. Because one of the things about Montezuma is that he had really really sharply uh, increased the class divisions in Aztec society. Right. So he he had pretty much abolished um, the kind of uh, you know mer uh, meritorious nobles, the Guelpili, uh who could you know kind of rise up to the ranks. Instead, restricting you know high level access to people who are already nobility. So, uh, and he fought. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. So so where did Montezuma come from? Because last time we left the Aztecs, the you know the king had died, and then they they put in the Mexica had put in some other guy. Mm -hmm. Um, well, as, as uh, king. the king, the, yeah, the the Tlatuani, the, the Tlatuani of Texcoco had died. Uh, Moctezuma uh, was the Tlatuani of Tenochtitlan. Okay, he was right. the actually one who installed um, Kakama as the ruler of Texcoco. Okay. So okay. he'd actually, yeah, he'd actually been in power since about the early 1500s, about like uh, 1502, 1503, somewhere around there. Right. Is kind of the general idea. Okay. So he'd actually been, yeah, he had, and he had a long storied history as a, as a military leader behind that. And so um, he was a so, successful yeah. military leader. Yeah, absolutely. He he uh, presided over some of the largest uh, expansions of Aztec, ter Aztec territory in their history. In fact, um, uh, he'd mostly been focused down on the region uh, which is now Oaxaca, uh, and had really kind of, you know, made the Aztec uh, presence there more than just kind of, uh, you know, a couple of scattered supply chain details to really kind of start, you know, consolidating and pacifying the area. Okay, so he wasn't because it, it's interesting because in this narrative, you know, he's always the guy who, you know, who lost the kingdom. Um, <laughs> yeah, and so so he did have a, a prestigious past. Um, now he's probably most familiar to to most of our audience as Montezuma, um, but where did, where where is that? Was that like a not an Anglicanization, I guess, but a um, <laughs> a, a, Spanishization. A, a Spanishization of of his name Montezuma? His Spanishization, yeah, yeah. So the one of the things is that um, first of all the so uh, Nahuatl started getting written in uh, the kind of the Spanish you know orthography pretty early on. Um, almost immediately, really. Hmm. But the standardization of it took some time to really um, catch on, and particularly in Cortez's letters uh, back to Spain, you know, these very, very early, early accounts, the proper names are just completely, completely mangled when you look at them. Hmm. Um, so, you know, Tenochtitlan becomes something like Timishta, 
or Timishtitan or something like that. Uh, you know, Cholula becomes Chural Tega or something like that. Okay. It, it's these, yeah, there's a huge amount in, you know, because they're hearing this for the first time and they're trying to transcribe and they're like, oh, can you say that one more time? Can you maybe sound it out? Yeah. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you know, and so there's a there's a huge kind of uh, variance in the orthography. So uh, Montezuma or Moctezuma uh, came down as as basically a very popular way to spell it because Montezuma is very easy to say as opposed to Montezuma, mm. um, uh, which has at its core uh, uh, Tecutli, which is Lord, because uh, Montezuma, his name literally means uh, he who frowns like a lord, or you know, uh, or the angry lord. Right. Um, and he's actually uh, Montezuma Shokoyot. Uh, uh, Montezuma the Younger, or Montezuma the Second, as sometimes called, because uh, one of the very early and successful uh, imperial kings uh, was uh, Montezuma el Wicamina, uh, who had been, who was his, uh, I believe, uh, uh, great grandfather. Grandfather, I'd have to look at my my genealogy, but yeah. So yes, Cortez has entered the city. Yeah, Cortez and and uh, Montezuma have greeted each other warmly uh, and, and as friends, and. <clears throat> Have have assured each other that everything that happened in the past is that's in the past, and you know now we can move forward from here. And Cortez tells him that you know I come from this great king, and by the way, you're now his vassal, uh, and you just need to recognize that. And by the way, could you maybe convert to Christianity? Um, you know the standard. Sure. So uh, <laughs> now was that translated? So, so he read it in Spanish, but was that did, did Montezuma understand that at all? So. Uh, it's not clear whether there's actually only about one point um, where where Cortez officially is recorded as, as kind of reading uh, the Requerimiento. Right. Um, and that's actually very, very early on when he was still in the Maya region. Um, and so while he has these kind of speeches um, whenever he shows up at a new place, it's it's not really... It's probably not that he was, you know, officially reading this, you know, official document so much as he was just kind of conveying his kind of general opening, you know, spiel. Mm. Um, but yes, he was doing it in Spanish. And this is actually recorded in his own... Uh, in his own account and in other uh, Spanish accounts, uh, and in the, the the indigenous accounts as well, that he would you know he was doing the thing where he speaks to Aguilar in Spanish, who then speaks to you know Malinche, and then Malinche speaks to Montezuma, and then back. So that's how this is going along. Okay. So mm-hmm. yes. Yeah. Yeah. So here uh, here we actually have another divergence between the Spanish and the indigenous sources, because according to uh, the indigenous sources like uh, Sahagun who wrote um, what's called the general history of the things of New Spain, uh, which is usually known by its most famous copy, which is the Florentine Codex. Mm -hmm. It's basically this massive encyclopedia of all things, um, of all things Mexican. Um, uh, His account, the uh, the Nahuatl account, says that uh, pretty much almost as immediately as the Spanish got into the city, they, you know, seized seized Moctezuma and carried him into the, to the, uh, the, the palace that they had been set up in as quarters, you know, firing off their guns to cause confusion. Right. Leaving everyone kind of confused and wondering what happened. So they really did not uh, in the Spanish account, you know, sort of they. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. In the Spanish account, because remember, uh, and the bias here is that the Spanish are, are trying to seem like they have a reason for everything they do. They're trying to seem not like the bad guys. They they're justified in all their mm. attacks throughout mm. this entire thing. Which, if you if you look through uh, Aztec history, you can also see the same strand where they never attacked anyone without provocation. Right. Uh, they may have kind of put them in a position where, you know, they had no other choice but to, you know, attack. You know, if if the Aztecs open your doorstep and they say, hey, uh, what you need to do is give us, you know, four hundred bowls of, of gold dust and you know a thousand feathers every uh, twice every year. Yeah. Um, you know, because or else we'll be as gravely friends, insulted. Give... <laughs> yeah, and we, exactly. you know, we cannot let this yeah. stand. And you know, how dare you insult us in this yeah. way? Yeah, sure. Yeah, and the, the Spanish are doing the same thing here because uh, in their account, while they're staying in Tenochtitlan, they receive word from the from the coast that um, the Aztec garrison there had attacked the city of Simpuala, who who were their coastal allies, and kind of brought who had stopped paying tribute and brought them back into the fold and made them start paying tribute. Mm. And so. Mm-hmm. You know, okay. uh, Cortez goes. You know, in the Spanish account, Cortez uh, uh, has you know meets with with uh, Montezuma and says, you know, hey, you know, you attacked our friends, and this isn't very good. And uh, and uh, Montezuma says, look, you know, this 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 you know this wasn't my. I swear, I had no idea. <laughs> it's just, it wasn't. You know, it's a sheer simple misunderstanding. But right. at that point, uh, in the Spanish account, that's where they take him captive. Okay. Um, and yeah, in the Spanish account, it's all very. Um, very kind of like dignified, and it's it's this process of the Spanish accounts a very 
uh, are infantilizing towards uh, Montezuma. Right. They make him seem very weak and vacillating, and that's the, the image that's come down to the years because those mm. are very popular account. Mm. Um, you know, they have him weeping and apologizing, and then kind of like um, glumly accepting the the imprisonment. Um, whereas, you know, of course, in the in the in the you know, the Nahuatl accounts, because they want to show him as strong and powerful, they have him being you know seized in this you know in this, in right, this rush. Yes, and um, and the, the truth probably lies, of course, somewhere in between. Um, How old so, is Moctezuma uh, at this point? So uh, the so the Spanish accounts put him. Uh, like uh, Bernal Diaz de Castillo specifically says that he was in his 40s, okay. um, which is probably probably true. He's probably in his, his like mid 40s to mid 50s, somewhere in that area. Right. Just judging from, um, you so, know, he, so he's uh, not exactly an old man. He's still sort of at the no. peak of his authority, I guess. Yeah, he's yeah he's 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 not an old man, but you know he's been in power for a long time. Sure. And some of the ideas that have been put forth why he didn't wasn't quite so forceful in responding mm. uh, was that perhaps he had grown a bit complacent. Right. Um, but another uh, another way of looking at it is that he responded, you know, kind of backhandedly, maybe not in maybe not overtly, but you know, if we believe the account that you know he had sent word to Cholula to you know have the Spanish killed, mm. he was already responding. You yeah. know, if we believe the you know that he you know he just did not expect him, that at a at a diplomatic parley meeting that they would kidnap him. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, so the Spanish, um, you know, uh, take him captive and have him, you know, and have him order the captains of the garrison who had attacked uh, uh, the Spanish to- coastal allies to come back to Tenochtitlan. Where they then, without uh, consulting uh, Moctezuma, uh, hold a trial, convict them of treason, and then bring Moctezuma out, put him in chains, and make him watch as they burn these people alive. Right. Um, so the Spanish convict these raiders of treason. Yes, the, yeah, and wow. they're not in their minds. They're raiders, and you know, in yeah, the Aztec okay. things, these are people saying, oh, "Okay, we just put down a rebellion." Yeah. Right. You, you know. Is, this is my job. I put down rebellions. Okay. Um, great benefits. So, <laughs> so it's, it's interesting um, that that story you told before about the feast of the flayed man. Like just the parallels of, um, you know, give us your daughter, and we'll, and you know, okay, yeah, sure. Here's my daughter. Oh well, we're going to tear off her skin and wear it like a suit. Um, you know, call back your soldiers from the coastal villages. Oh, we're going to burn them all alive. Um, yeah, mm. it's actually yeah, it, it's one of those things, and. Um, uh, so there was actually a Spanish priest, uh, Bartolomeo de las Casas, who wrote uh, a short account of the destruction of the Indies, right. which was this, you know, sh- scathing polemic of of all these, you know, Spanish atrocities, including the the, the massacre of Cholula. And uh, Bernal Diaz del Castillo actually um, part of his true history is is serving as a rejoinder to de las Casas, because as much as he, you know, harps on Gomara getting it wrong, he also harps on de las Casas getting it wrong, saying, right. "Look, you weren't there, man. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. it was us or them." You need me but, on that uh, wall. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And but it's you know but it's also an interesting comparison to say like you know well the Aztec religion was as a central tenet you know built around human sacrifice, mm. but then you have uh, the Spanish who um, by all accounts the burning people alive you know shocked the Aztecs. They were they yeah. thought that you know that was barbaric. Well, because um, this because is they, an interesting thing because they were essentially burned alive for religious reasons. Yeah. You know, in a sense, because if if you create commit well, a civic yeah. crime, you're normally beheaded. But burning was for heretics. Um, yeah, and there's there's really no division between the the political and the religious in the in this episode in, mm. in this, this time in in the period of the conquest. But were there any for the Aztecs with, with yeah. Cortez at this point in the expedition? Yeah, Cortez was actually the first expedition to Mexico to bring a priest. Right. He only brought one priest, and we we really don't ever hear about him much. Right. But okay. yeah, he, we do know that he had a priest with him. Right. Um, yeah, and so for the Aztecs, it was actually it was extra offensive because you know to burn someone alive because they did uh, cremate people, um, and it was usually reserved as kind of for um, high people, uh, kind of it was a high respect. It was if you uh, were someone who died honorably or someone of, of noble birth, you would be cremated and that would release your soul, you know, to go up and to the Aztec heaven. Right. Okay. Uh, yeah, which is following the sun across the sky. Um, pretty great. So, uh, so it was. To them, it was not only this, you know, barbaric practice of burning someone alive. You know, at least when we cut the heart out, they're dead like that. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, no, people? that's it. You know, like, gosh, you know, it takes us, you know, like three minutes to kill them our way, whereas it takes them like thirty minutes to die your way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, and you know, but it was also a perversion of one of their funerary rituals. So mm. it was, you know. It's one of the things where, and particularly the fact that, you know, uh, Montezuma, it was really the first point, the turning point, where he realizes he is now a captive. Right. Because he is literally put in chains to watch this, and he protests, you know, very strongly. But, of course, in the Spanish accounts, 
Cortez goes over and calms him down and says, it's okay, Monty, it's fine, calm down. Um, because the Spanish accounts, even even uh, Bernal Diaz, uh, Diaz del Castillo, who specifically said, you know, like, look, a lot's been said about Cortez, and he's, he's great, but I'm not, this isn't about Cortez, it's about the people who, you know, were with him. As opposed to Gomara, who is, of course, um, saying everything that happened was Cortez, and he's great, and he's wonderful, and he's basically Spanish Jesus. Um, right. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah. So it, it's kind of a turning point where, you know, things get very real. Mm. And as this goes on, and it, it's probably, you know, to, you know, since it's going out to, to our, our listeners on Reddit, um, we've all seen the... Uh, the you know the, the you know the image you know I didn't know what to expect or you know things like that I don't know what and I expected pre- from the rest of <laughs> exactly yeah, yeah. yeah I don't I don't know what I expected and it's this is the kind of the point where uh, Moctezuma says oh why why did I let these people in my city <laughs> yeah <laughs> um, so there's basically the a idea, giant bag yeah. of dead dove do not eat um, exactly on, on yeah. Of Spain. yeah okay yeah in the form of of burned uh, Mexica so mm. um, <laughs> and while this is going on, so this kind of sets off a kind of a six-month period, uh, roughly, uh, which is the most awkward part of, of Aztec history, because not really much happens um, from the time that Cortes enters the city to about spring of 1520. The it, It's this period where uh, Moltecuzuma is basically under house arrest with Cortes, and they kind of hang out and go on awkward dates in a way. Wow! Like Cortez, yeah. Like they build boats and they go tour around the lakes, and then. Uh, so the, the, uh, the reason why the like, Aztecs, you know, the Aztecs didn't attack because they had uh, Moctezuma hostage. Yeah, uh, in in a sense, yes, because you know he was he had built up this very kind of uh, absolute monarchy, mm. and that's usually how he's how he's described his style of rule that he had been kind of creeping towards an absolute monarchy. But at the same time, so, you know, he was the one who had to give them the order attack. And as long as he was still in charge, no one really had the authority to launch an attack uh, unless he said so. Because I always wondered, why didn't, you know, someone else just say, all right, well, he's no longer the king, I'm the king. Uh, you know, I mean, it just seems strange. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, if he'd build up a, a structure of absolute monarchy yeah. around himself. Yeah. Uh, well, the other idea is, you know, what was what was what was he thinking himself? Because mm. he still had contact with people, yeah. and so the question is like, why didn't why didn't he order the attack? Mm. And there's a huge amount of speculation because we don't actually have, you know, we have Cortez writing and we have Spanish writing and we have, you know, people collecting histories later in mm. in, in the native language, but we don't have uh, Moctezuma's own thoughts. Right. You know, his is a voice that other people tell, and so there's speculation here that maybe he still thought that he could flip the Spanish to his side. Okay. You know. Or maybe he could do that thing because he, you know, consistently gives them gifts, um, and even basically uh, allows them to plunder the storerooms and you know take gold and melt it down. Right. Uh, you know, under a bit of duress, but you know, it's still he still allows that to happen. He still had potentially had hope that he could come out on top. Yeah, you know, in that in that sense that I was telling you earlier, where like, okay, look, here's a bunch of gold, just go. And there are repeated times in in uh, both narratives where he says, "Look, here's a gift. Now will you go back to Spain?" Right. Um, so there's this idea, like, "Look, you just let just leave, okay? Look, I'll just wait this out and just leave." Because of um, course, someone coming and taking the gift and staying and staying and staying was unprecedented. Yeah, it's just it's just rude. Right. Yeah. It's just yeah. not the done uh, thing. <laughs> it's 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 outside the discourse. <laughs> so. <laughs> to get fancy. Yeah. Uh, so what happens in in uh, about April, uh, April-ish, uh, is that uh, uh, Gonzalo Vasquez, Velasquez finally sends another expedition to bring Cortez back to Cuba. And this is the Narvez expedition. Uh, and it lands on uh, the coast of Veracruz uh, and quickly kind of moves into Simpuala and kind of, you know, sets itself up there and starts spreading you know, basically starts sending out messages saying, look, this guy I've been dealing with, Cortez, he's a rebel, he's illegitimate, I'm the real emissary of this great king in Spain, and you should stop listening to him and, you know, dump everything. He is a traitor, and, you know, you should bring me his head. Right. So, of course, Cortez has to go back to the coast to deal with this. So he leaves kind of a token force of about uh, a few dozen men um, under the, the uh, command of this guy named Alvarado. Uh, at Tenochtitlan, and he marches back to the coast, sending some uh, messengers ahead to kind of scout out um, how many troops that you know, how many troops were there, and who was there. And interestingly, again, he doesn't bring a lot of native forces with him on this expedition on this trip back to the coast. 
And there's a couple of reasons that have been kind of speculated this as well. One of them is that Cortez may not have wanted uh, the native allies to see conflict between the Spanish. Right. Uh, another is that he didn't want them to see that the Spanish could be defeated. So he didn't want, you know, he had built up this reputation as, you know, it was this very tough, heavy force, which of course it was. The, you know, these are battle-tested men. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, with, you know, with, you know, with, you know superior weapons and armor. Um, you know, but they were still, you know, outnumbered, and they could still die, and still had died in many numbers, but they hadn't really been decisively fe- uh, defeated. Um, they had always kind of wiggled out of it at the last minute. So he returns back to the coast, and having sent these messengers ahead, messengers who were kind of hanging out in the camp of Narvez and talking about all the riches that had, that had gotten and how rich they were all going to get, and, you know, they had all these gold and gems and all these wonderful things, and are you sure you want to just, you know, pack up and go back to Cuba? Wouldn't you rather stay here and join us? So by the time Cortez arrives back on the coast, there's um, there's massive dissent within uh, the Narvez camp. And uh, there's kind of a brief kind of uh, standoff negotiation where Cortez sends this letter ahead where he says, Hey, look, you know, I fulfilled my duty um, under the expedition that Velasquez gave me. I'm now op- operating as an independent person. You can just ask the king of Spain. And Narvez reads it out loud and kind of laughingly and dismisses it. <laughs> but when Cortez shows up, <laughs> and when Cortez shows up with his, you know, uh, troops, he's, you know, he is, he has about uh, 250, 300 troops with him. And uh, Narvez has uh, about 800 men with him, plus, you know, almost 100 horse, yeah, okay. a bunch of uh, muskets and crossbows and extra cannons. Cortez is completely outnumbered. But he sets out camp outside of Simpawala, and then in the night, he launches a surprise attack. And that night, uh, many, many, many of the troops that had been brought to send him home just kind of say, eh, we'll stand aside. You guys fight, fight this out. Yeah, yeah, we don't really care at this point. Yeah. And with, with minimal, minimal uh, casualties, Cortez captures Narvez. And Narvez spends the next, you know, uh, two years as a captive in Veracruz. Cortez scoops up all his men. Um, they defect to his side. Mm. And then marches back to uh, Tenochtitlan. Because now he's gotten word that um, something uh, disastrous has happened, and something that will set the stage for the rest of, of the conquest, and really set off the conquest right. in a true kind of war fashion, is that uh, Alvarado, who had been left at Tenochtitlan, uh, had been there when uh, the Toshkot festival was held. And it's one of the most, it's probably one of the, the, the biggest festivals in the Aztec calendar. Um, it's the it's the festival of, uh, of Tezcatlipoca, who is this very important god, uh, and it, there's this very famous aspect to it where there's there was a uh, this you know this one captive of you know perfect perfect body and mind and charming and wonderful you know this perfect human specimen is picked out to live as uh, as an ishipa yeah. of uh, of te- uh, te- uh, Tezcatlipoca for a year before being sacrificed. Right, and so this is every this, year it happens. And and this is every year, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so this is on the uh, 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 Shiupawali, uh, which is the 360-day calendar plus the five empty days. So it's the it's the solar calendar, not the 260-day uh, um, religious calendar, I guess you could say. Oh, they're both religious calendars. Right. So, yeah, so what had happened is that Alvarado, um, in the Spanish accounts, the the uh, the Mexica come to him and say, hey, we'd like your permission to hold this festival. I would guess that did not actually happen. I guess they held the festival regardless of what he would say, but... Mm-hmm. That's that's how it comes down, you know. Yeah. Um, the Spanish thought that they were in charge. So they said, "Yes, you can hold this thing." Mm-hmm. And Alvarado, um, when he's speaking in some of the accounts uh, in like Gomara or uh, Castillo, you know, he says, "Well, well, I was kind of interested to see what happened. Also, I was pretty sure that immediately after this, uh, you know, immediately after this this festival, they were going to attack me." Right. So. His spidey so senses I, were I attacked, tingling. <laughs> exactly. So I attacked them first. So it's a very similar setup to what happened in Cholula, where right. um, there were thousands of uh, unarmed people, in fact, the, the top elites of, of, uh, of Tenochtitlan, all gathered in the central plaza, and at you know a signal, um, the, as, uh, the Spanish troops come charging in and firing cannons in the crowd to start you know, slaughtering people left and right. Oh, wow. Uh, and, it, and it almost... It, it, Almost, you know, kind of decapitates the, you know, the top elites of Tenochtitlan. It's this huge blow against them, you know, kind of preemptively, mm. um, which is why most people don't think that. You know, in most interpretations, it's not really seen as, oh, Alvarado. You know, <laughs> good thing you heard about that plot that there was no evidence of. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, the question is, the real question, the real question is, did he act on his own? Or was this an order given by Cortez? And if it was an order given by Cortez or a plan that had been happening, um, did he do it early? Or did he, uh, you know, did he kind of jump the gun? Or, you know, or did he kind of, or was this actually the order given that, you know, if you have a chance, take it? Yeah, sure. So if you say one, all yeah. of the, the, all the elites, elites together. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and if you, yeah, get that chance, go ahead and get them. Yeah. Um, so... There's really, and you know, so, and there's some speculation that maybe it was thinking like, okay, well, if we do this, we can kind of replicate the, you know, the kind of coup that happened in Cholula, and if we kill all the elites, then we can put our own guys in charge. Um, and that, of course, didn't happen. Although they still hold on, held on to Moctezuma. So, what happens immediately after this is that this is just the last straw for the Mexica. Uh, they've tolerated these, you know, bearded, foul-smelling white people, um, and at least one black guy as well. Um, uh, for long enough, and Cortez starts marching back to his men and the uh, Tlaxcalans with them, several thousand, uh, basically besieged inside uh, Tenochtitlan, inside their quarters. And uh, by the time he gets there, you know they're you know they're running out of food. They're in, they're in a very bad way. But as uh, as Cortez and his uh, and the Spanish they brought with them from the coast, so he has maybe you know almost maybe a thousand men coming in there with uh, several thousand of uh, slash Calon auxiliaries and uh, allies. Mm. Um, he marches into the city, and the city is seemingly deserted. Everyone's staying inside, and this is really you know it's this very eerie kind of uh, thing if you picture it. You know yeah, this army kind of marching see. in, expecting attack from any side, yeah. and they march in and they kind of unmolested go and join up with Alvarado. Uh, and in the uh, Nahuatl accounts, this is said uh, that the reason there was no attack is that the Mexica wanted to show Cortez that they didn't start this. Um, nice. Another explanation, a more kind of uh, you know tough nose, tough nose way of looking at it, is saying, why fight on two fronts when you can get these people to walk directly into the trap where everyone else is besieged? Yeah, well, why okay. not let them do it? So, um, because as they try to break out, as this kind of joint uh, Tlash and Spanish force tries to break out, they were buffed several, several times. Um, and the causeways over the, uh, so the bridges over the canals uh, where they're staying are cut, uh, and they, you know, they're trying to find their way out. And every time they try to break out, they're repulsed by the, you know, these massed attacks by Mexica uh, soldiers. And they even try to build uh, siege towers, um, which uh, do absolutely nothing. Okay. Um, <laughs> they build them and then they immediately fail. Essentially, were they were they um, uh, familiar with siege warfare at all? Um, was that something uh, that they would do? Uh, the Aztecs, mm. um, not particularly. There's not really. I mean, there are instances of siege warfare, but uh, a siege warfare wasn't exactly a huge thing in yeah. Mesoamerica. Uh, more because of logistic constraints. Sure. So, I mean, were the there large walled no... cities? Oh yeah, yeah. Actually, right. uh, 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 Moctezuma himself it was famous for kind of. Um, uh, defeating the city called uh, Quetzaltepec, which famously had these, you know, seven concentric rings of very thick walls that had to be breached um, as they went along. But th- that was not that was not the the typical thing. Okay. Um, yeah, and you know, Tenochtitlan itself was you know was really ringed by a large lake that mostly protected it, so it wasn't yeah. a walled city. Um, so, <clears throat> and this is uh, so. The Spanish and, and the Tlaxcalans have been kind of rebuffed in their attempts to um, get out of the city. And Cortez is, is feeling a, a little bit desperate. You know, supplies are very much running low. So he plans a, uh, a kind of, you know, a last-ditch maneuver to have uh, Moctezuma go out onto a balcony and speak to the people besieging them and try to calm them down. Right. But the problem with this is that even though Moctezuma had become a bit of a, uh, a, bit of a proto-tyrant there were still expectations of a Tlatuani in Mesoamerica. Mm. And the expectation is that you were smart, you were competent, and you were capable. And in fact, uh, previously, um, there had been a Tlatuani named Tizak, who had reigned only a short five years, and the story goes that he was so incompetent, and it was so useless, that he was actually poisoned by the elites. So right. this is not a society that rewards failure, and Cortez had thought this was kind of a monarchy, as in a European monarchy back home, where... Yeah, sure, he's like a god look, king, I'm, and I would have to... Exactly, more of a divine right, where this is mm. more of kind of a meritocratic king. And Cortez, in you know preventing uh, Moctezuma to carry out his duties, had un- been undermining his own tool for controlling the Aztec state. Mm. So Moctezuma goes out and, you know, s- tries to give this, you know, this quelling speech, uh, and in the Spanish accounts, he's struck with sling stones and arrows uh, and dies. 
and then uh, thereby proving that it is not nobler to suffer the swing slings and arrows. Um, uh, but in the, <laughs> yeah, the Nawad accounts, um, he goes out there and he's, you know, people reject him and they throw, you know, arrows and, sh- you know, shoot arrows and throw sling stones at him, but, you know, he's shielded by the Spanish who then bring him aside and strangle him because they know he's no longer useful. useful. Okay. Yeah, uh, and the same account, and the same, uh, there's the same dichotomy in the death, or how the body is delivered out to the, the Mexica as well. Because in the Spanish accounts, they very, very respectfully carry his body out and hand it over to the elites of the of Tenochtitlan and say, look, you know, here's, you know, here's your king, and, you know, we're sorry this had to happen, but, you know, you're the ones who killed him, and right. also, by the way... By our rules, his nephew, who is inside with us, is now king of Snowshoe Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, you know, it's one of those, again, it's a complete cultural misunderstanding. Right. Um, in the Nahuatl accounts, the Spanish open the door of the, you know, open, you know, open uh, an entryway of where there's a hold up and just toss the body out in the street and then right. shut the door again. Yeah, okay. So... Uh, so at this point, you know, it is on, uh, and there's two sides opposed, opposing, and as you said earlier, like, why didn't they just, you know, get rid of Moctezuma and just appoint a new guy? And mm. this is exactly what they do. They elect um, a new Tlatawani called uh, Quitloac, who was a brother of Moctezuma, because, again, it, it goes brother to brother to brother. Right. Um, <clears throat> but while this is happening, uh, the Spanish lead their very, very famous attempt to break out of the city at night. Ah, yes. Known as, uh, yeah, yeah. the Noche Triste. Yes. And so because uh, the bridges of the canals have been cut, they build, a, they, build, uh, a, they build a single, and this is kind of a poor planning on their part, they build a single portable bridge. And so they sneak out at night, uh, you know, several thousand men sneaking out at night, very, very quiet. With cannons uh, and, and stuff get... as well? <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, with cannons. Um <laughs> Uh, well, not not many. And these were actually there were two kinds of cannons that were brought with them. There were these lighter cannons called uh, falconets, and then there were heavier cannons called lombards. And I'm sure someone who knows more about medieval cannonry yes. can expand on that. But yeah. it's light cannons and heavy cannons. And okay. most of the heavy cannons have been left back at Veracruz, so they mostly had light cannons with them. So right. anyway, so they they reached the first um, you know uh, unbridged canal, and they put their temporary bridge over, and they 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 walk across it and then you know of course by the time the front of that you know convoy reaches the next you know broken canal uh people are still crossing so they you know they're bunched up bunched mm, up mm. and we know where to go and of course they're discovered and what happens is this running fight through the city as they try to um get to the nearest causeway which leads out to Tlacopan over to the west right and even though that's in the opposite direction they want to go, they want to go back east to Tlaxcala, it Eventually. is the shortest causeway. Yeah. Yeah, but it's the shortest causeway. They figured, look, we don't, we don't want to be on these things for very long. We want to get out of here as quickly as possible. So they start fighting their way out. Uh, and along the way, you know, it's this, you know, Lenoche Triste is the night of sorrows. Um, and I'm sure it was very, very sorrowful for the Spanish and their Tlaxcalan allies because, um, you know, hundreds of Spanish died and thousands of Clash Collins died. But for the Mexica, this is a major victory. You know, sure, they've finally sure. driven out these weird, you know, these weird smell, foul-smelling guys out of their city. Um, and, you know, uh, you know the, the famous story is of, of the Spanish trying to carry so much gold with them that when they fall into the lake, they, you know, they sink the bottom they and they drown. Okay. Things like that. Yeah. <laughs> it's, this very, it's this very kind of gory, melodramatic uh, telling of the tale. And they lose, you know, all their cannons and most of their powder. And, you know, they're, they're reduced to, you know, foot soldiers and, and some horsemen. And they, even as they they flee, because they make it over to Tlacopan, and they start fleeing north, so they can cut around uh, the lakes of, of uh, the Valley of Mexico. And to the north is much less uh, populated. Hmm. It's it's a much sparser populated, and so they figure, okay, we can get around that way, and it's you know more open terrain because the south part is kind of like a coastline up against mountains. So they figure, you know, we have more maneuverability, you know, less less people to fight through. But, you know, they're being harassed their entire way, and it seems very dire until they reach this Otomi village, uh, which had no love with the Aztecs whatsoever. It was subjugated by them, but they were not happy about that. And so the Otomis give them supplies and let them rest and kind of shield them for a while and give them a chance to catch their breath going going on. And so as they round the lakes, they reach this region of, uh, called uh, Otopan, uh, which now is known as Otumba. And this very, very famous battle occurs, the Battle of Otumba. And it's really, this is the first time that Aztec forces... And the Spanish uh, and Tlaxcalan forces have really fought in an actual battle, not kind of, you know, weird city urban warfare. Right, so this um, is an open pitched field battle. Yeah, yes, and in particular it is open. And that proves a very decisive um, 
uh, disadvantage to the Aztecs because, uh, first of all, the idea is that this wasn't actually led by the Tlatelwani himself. And the idea is that the, the, the Tlatelwani would be the one who leads the armies. But mm. instead, uh, Cuitlahuac has to be back in uh, Tenochtitlan kind of shoring up his own political um, uh, future. Right. Uh, doing things like, uh, uh, you know, like the, the Spanish actually killed um, Kakama uh, on their way out of the city. Uh, and Kikama had been the uh, the ruler the of, of, of Texcoco. The king of the city, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, and they had actually deposed him earlier when they accused him of of plotting to uh, attack the Spanish while they were while they were in uh, Tenochtitlan and put a kind of a puppet ruler in there. So one of the first things that Quetzalcoatl does is kill that puppet ruler and put his own ruler in place. Right. Um, but anyway, uh, so instead, what you see is there's. Uh, the, the numbers are kind of fishy and, and squishy, definitely squishy, but uh, something like, you know, twenty to 30,000 uh, Aztec troops meets um, a few hundred, you know, about four, about th- you know, 400 Spanish troops, um, a couple dozen horsemen, and several thousand flesh gallons on this open field of uh, Otumba. And they are decisively, decisively defeated. Because what happens is that the Aztecs uh, are just broken apart by the cavalry. Um, mm. Remember, the, the Spanish are, are low on powder, uh, so they don't have, you know, their their muskets are almost out of, you know, they only have a few muskets left. Um, their crossbows are, um, you know, they've lost most of them, mm-hmm. and they have no cannons. And so this is actually where it, it shows that I think one of the most decisive things, uh, advantages that the Spanish had was that they had cavalry. Mm. And the Aztecs literally had to learn thousands of years of, you know, horse-based yeah, yeah, warfare yeah, yeah. over the course of a couple months. Yeah, And this is their first experience with that and what happens is that the you know the Spanish and the Clash Gallons form up in this kind of defensive square and they're surrounded on all sides um, but they can break out with cavalry and what they do is that they see um, the person leading the army who was the uh, Siwakwat um, which is kind of uh, like the, the Grand Vizier in the in the Aztec system so they see this kind of Grand Vizier you know uh, vice president uh, up on kind of a low rise kind of surver- surveying and, and conducting the, the battle and they send the cavalry force out uh, to attack him. And they manage to kill him. And then that throws everything into disarray because they've, they've essentially just decapitated, you know, they've killed the general of the army and now everything is a bit, you know, no one knows, you know, there's no one directing the Aztecs at that point. You know, in 30,000 people, you can keep pockets of it organized, but, you know, when you have cavalry charging through you at all times, it, it gets um, messy. Yeah. So... Yeah, and so the Aztecs are very soundly defeated at that point and have to retreat. And uh, even though you know the Spanish suffer even more losses and the Tlaxcalans are almost completely wiped out in that battle, they still manage to limp back to Tlaxcala. So, what, um, what weapons would we be talking about? Because they wouldn't have had s- s- pikes or anything like that, would they? They would have been using like those um, those obsidian tips club things. Well, actually, they had both. Um, they both had. Um, uh, Makwawits, uh, which are the the kind of um, uh, picture a cricket bat with yes. uh, razor blades on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's a good way of looking at it. Yeah. Uh, but they also had um, these spears, which are these kind of uh, both. They were more used for kind of slashing um, and stabbing. Right. Uh, uh, but yeah, they would be a mix of kind of um, shock troopers, as they're sometimes called. These kind of uh, elite military orders who would be carrying the Makowitz, um going forward either with two-handed Makowitz, uh or uh, one-handed with a shield, and they would be backed up by people holding these spears. Um, and then behind them, and actually leading them, would be these volleys of sling stones and arrows. Right. And the people carrying the melee weapons themselves would be charging in with uh, with basically like javelins, the adat. Okay. Um, which they would use to break up things. So that's, but, yeah, so that's the, the general range. These spears that they would use, that would be, you know, maybe six foot long. They wouldn't be like your big 12 foot, 14 foot sort of phalanx mm. spears. No, but actually the interesting part is, and like, you know, like I said about having to learn, you mm, know, uh, cavalry warfare in, in the course of a few months, uh, by about, by the time the, uh, the, the Spanish and the Flash Gallons actually return to Tenochtitlan, you start seeing the emergence of these very, very long spears that the Aztecs start using right. to counteract the cavalry. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, it, it, it's a steep learning curve, but it is a learning curve. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the uh, the kind of the, the joint forces of the Flash Gallons and the Spanish make it back to the Clash to kind of regroup and uh, and basically at this point everyone takes a breather. Uh, and nothing really of major importance happens for the next few months. The Spanish um, go back to Tlaxcala, and they end up making a bunch of concessions to them, saying, okay, 
you won't have to pay us tribute, uh, and we'll split spoils with the, with you, and when we conquer these towns and these towns, we'll give you right to tribute from them, uh, and you know, when we conquer Tsunashi Lan, you can put up your own fortress in there, uh, and basically kind of giving in to a lot of demands from the Clash Gallons for kind of extra concessions. Right kind of putting themselves on, on more equal footing. Uh, Quitlawak, meanwhile, is kind of established, re- tr- trying to reestablish control around the valley. And so what would traditionally happen with a new Tlatawani is that he would go out on an expedition to, um, basically on a uh, what's called, called a coronation campaign. He would go out, he would capture a bunch of well, well, captives, he'd bring them back, and, be, and they would be sacrificed during the coronation ceremony, and then he would officially be the ruler. Okay, sure. Yeah, but instead what happens is that smallpox hits. Oh. And smallpox is actually introduced by um, a African slave who had come over with the Narvez expedition and then gone to Nochilan. And so uh, about mid-October, this massive outbreak of uh, smallpox hits into Nochilan. And <clears throat> over the course of about a year, of course, you know, uh, historical demographics are hard, but mm. the estimate is that about maybe 40% of the Valley of Mexico died over a course of the next year. Right, so this um, is a lot more devastating this, than the the Black Plague, the the Black Death was in Europe. Yeah, this is like the well, you know, depending on where you are, but it's like the Black Death in uh, in fast forward. Yeah. So right. instead of you know the Black Death killing a third of Europe, you know, over several years, this is kills, you know, uh, almost you know forty percent in the course of several months. Right. And during this time, uh, Quitlawak dies. He dies after you know uh, it's estimated about 80, 80 days in in office, essentially. Uh, and so the, the Aztecs are once again thrown into disarray. Mm. And every time this happens, every time you lose a, a Tlatawani, all these people who had been kind of under the thumb of the Aztecs start thinking, well, that guy conquered us, and we kind of owed him tribute, but we don't know about this new guy. Right. Not so yeah, much. Okay. And so these these little rebellions popping up all over the place, and people you know, refusing to send tribute. And so the, the Aztec political system is just in a mess. Uh, and right about this time, in uh, kind of... Uh, you know, uh, kind of maybe about uh, February 1521. Um, you know, everyone's had their time to kind of take a breather, re- regroup. More supplies have come in from uh, from Cuba because uh, uh, Velasquez initially sent you know boats to immediately follow uh, Narvez, expecting that he would you know mm-hmm. that he would take over. And the Spanish have been seizing those uh, and using them to resupply. And then they you know then they, then they start getting their own kind of independent supply of. of of uh, powder and, and crossbows and horses as well. Um, so right about in February, everyone's kind of had their breather, uh, and uh, 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 Quitlawak has died. A new, um, a new Tlatawani, uh, Quautemec, has been elected. He was the son of a, a previous Tlatawani, uh, and he was very young. He's, he's supposedly anywhere from his late teens to early twenties, early to mid twenties. Right. Um, and so. Uh, at that point, the Spanish have now returned back with the Tlaxcalan allies into kind of the southern area of the Valley of Mexico um, and starting to make a, a push in towards uh, the east coast of the lakes. And on the east coast of the lakes is Texcoco. Now, if you recall, uh, you know, the previous uh, you know, Mexica puppet, Kakama, had been killed mm. uh, and had been replaced by his brother, who was also kind of Mexica aligned, Koanakach, uh, 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 or Koanakoch. And when uh, Cortez and the Clash Callan armies arrive, and at this point, you know, this is tens of thousands of Clash Callans with, you know, a few hundred Spanish. Uh, and this, that would be the basic pattern that, you know, goes throughout the conquest. It's thousands and thousands and thousands of, of, of uh, natives with a few hundred Spanish as kind of this core uh, of heavy infantry and cavalry. And the, the shock uh, troopers, so, yeah, okay. Yeah, the shock troopers, yeah. yeah. And the idea is that, you know, you use the Spanish to break through the lines and then you exploit that with the native troops. So uh, this army shows up at Texcoco, and uh, you know the, the Tlatuani comes out and says, "Hey, I'm I'm so glad you're here. I you know I brought you this gift as a symbol of peace. Um, you know, why don't you just go ahead and camp here, and then you can come into the city tomorrow morning. How about that?" And of course they're like, uh, "That seems a little shady, but uh, we're glad you're you know you're accepting the fact that um, that you know that you are a vassal of Charles V, and you're going to convert Christianity." So, uh, but during the night. Uh, the the Spanish and uh, Clash Callan troops notice that uh, there's all these canoes fleeing the city, and essentially over, during the night, the entire uh, or at least most of the city of Clash Cala is or it's not Clash Cala, Texcoco is evacuated to Tenochtitlan, um, leaving behind um, kind of a, a skeleton crew there. And uh, so when Cortez marches in, he's met instead of you know by this kind of uh, this cheering defeated city, this kind of ghost town. But at the same time, if you recall. 
there was that you know rebel uh, Tashkokan prince, you know, Ishlil Shoshit, up north. And at the same time, Ishlil Shoshit marches down and meets him at Tashkoko and, uh, and assumes uh, the, the role of Tatawani of Tashkoko. So without even having to fight a single battle, Cortes has taken out the second most important city in the Aztec Empire and seized basically the entire east coast of Lake Texcoco. Uh, and it, it, yeah, wow. this is probably, and if you recall, this is actually what I started with, the kind of um, bad blood between uh, Tenochtitlan and Texcoco. And that's why this is so important, is that, you know, the Aztec Empire is just basically falling out from underneath them. Right. And so would the would the would the allies at this point? I mean, I guess we might address it later. But would they would they ever come to? I can understand why they had no love for the Aztecs. Would the, would they ever come to regret siding with the Spanish? Uh, in well, as they go on, the um, uh, Ishlu yes. yeah, Shashit uh, actually has a, a pretty good run with them. Um, the problem is that after the conquest, uh, they sometimes you know like the Tlaxcalans actually make up pretty well. Uh, some of the people who allied with the Spanish not so well. The problem is that the Spanish don't, again, don't really understand how the political system works. So they end up saying, okay, oh yeah, you're the you're the ruler of Texcoco, but that's mm. it. But Gosh. instead, they don't recognize that the person who had been the ruler of Texcoco was actually the ruler of this much wider array and net of uh, of kind of cities and tributary states. Mm. Okay. So it's a circum it's a, it's circumscribing the power. But you know, no one knew that at the time. At the time, they were just like, oh, finally, we can get rid of these Mexica jerks. <laughs> Um. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah. So, so uh, in one fell swoop, he's managed to conquer a huge amount of um, amount of people, I guess, um, or territory. Yeah. yeah. And what happens next is basically this kind of running battle around the lakes, um, where no one can really get uh, an advantage. So uh, the Spanish, you know, try to uh, you know advance up the causeways into Tenochtitlan, but you know they can only get so far before you know, and they're beset on all sides by the the war canoes of the, of the Mexica who would attack them on all sides, and you know they advance up the causeway and then have to retreat back at night. They advance up the causeway and have to retreat back at night, and they take you know a city here, but then the Mexica would attack them over here, and there's this running battle for several months where no one's really having an advantage on either side. Uh, and that really changes when um, with the brigantines. So uh, among the Spanish was uh, this, uh, this master shipbuilder, as he's come to know. He may have just been an ordinary shipbuilder, but apparently he did pretty well for himself, uh, Martin Lopez. And he had been ordered by uh, Cortez to build uh, 12 brigantines, which are these kind of um, smaller, two-masted, uh, shallow draft boats that could, you know, suitable. Um, it's something like I think they're like something like forty feet long. There's there's some I'm, I'm sure someone who knows boats can say oh or ships I'm sorry can actually fill in the details. But <laughs> these you know these are kind of Get small right, European stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Look, I study Aztec history, not you know Spanish naval history. Come on. Yeah. Um, who would be interested so, in that? I mean, honestly. <laughs> it's silly. But what they are is they they are um, they're larger boats than the, than the Aztec canoes, and also the Spanish are able to mount uh, cannons on them. So each one is mounted with a cannon. And so what they're now able to do is project their kind of artillery power uh, into the lakes. And so uh, they start turning the tide okay. on the naval war. Yep. Uh, and, you know, it's, uh, you know, Tenochtitlan is like Britain. You have to defeat the navy before you can, you know, yeah, attack yeah, the, yeah, the country. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so then it turns from this kind of slow grinding land war into this slow grinding naval war as, uh, you know, the Mexica do things like they lure, uh, you know, they hide in, the, the, you know, the reeds and rushes um, around like kind of the shallow, shallow areas of Lake Texcoco. Uh, and, you know, when the brigantines see, uh, you know, a supply ship that just happens to be floating out there by itself, they run into attack and get impaled on these spikes that have Gosh. been driven into the, uh, the shallow ground. Um, and so... Uh, you know, the Mexicas sink one of them, but the, the Spanish catch on, and then they, they kind of reverse the thing, and they, uh, and they you know, catch the Mexica in a, in a similar kind of trap, and there's this back and forth where, you know, no one's having the advantage, but the Spanish are now able to kind of slow, it, it's turned towards their favor. Um, and they start moving up the causeways, but they still have to retreat back every night. Oh, what was that? Well, yeah, I don't uh, know. Was so, that you or me? <laughs> <laughs> I think it was me. Right. Um, so, but they still have to treat back every night. So Cortez gives the order to have uh, uh, native laborers as they go forward um, because parts of the causeway have been cut. And so he now says, okay, look, when we go forward, we're going to fill in the causeways as we go. Fill in the causeways as we go. And when we reach a larger spot, we're going to camp there and we're just going to have to you know, fight it out. Um, and so uh, 
the Spanish start slowly, slowly, slowly advancing the causeway in this point. And there's actually a point where uh, they get a little overconfident and they cross a, a broken causeway without filling in the gap. And they get all these troops, including Cortez himself, trapped on one side of this broken causeway because then the, uh, the uh, Aztec canoes come in and cut them off behind there. Uh, and Cortez himself is also, is almost captured, and he's just he's saved by a cavalry charge, which comes out and you know pulls him out of these mass of of, of Mexica warriors, which are dragging him away. Gotcha. Um, but something like fifty or sixty Spanish are captured, and then um, very publicly um, sacrificed in front of the kind of encamped Spanish troops. Right. Um, and then okay. the uh, the yeah the severed heads and flayed skin of not only the Spanish but their horses as well are sent around to. Uh, the neighboring uh, uh, native cities to say, look, these people are not invincible. And for a while, the the, the tide kind of turns, and the Spanish are once again beaten back um, across the causeway. So it's this really, you know, it's it's the reason it's called a siege, not because the Spanish were sitting outside the walls, because there were no walls, yeah, but because it is this very grinding, grinding. You know, you get the advantage one day, you lose it the next. Right. Okay. Um, but now we're coming into the final stretch, uh, where <clears throat> the Spanish finally, eventually, make it over the causeways, into Tenochtitlan itself. And uh, once again, they're faced with this thing where they will they will take a position, and then in the night, that position will be taken back by the Mexica. You know, um, they'll tear down some barricades, and then later on, the barricades will be rebuilt. So uh, Cortez orders uh, the, you know, the thousands of Indian uh, laborers who are with him to start tearing down everything as they go. So instead of you know going in, taking position, then falling back to a more fortified position, they go in, they take a position, and then tear down everything. So there's you know nothing left. Uh, They're literally right. tearing down the city as they advance across it. Okay. Yeah, and there's some notable and there's some notable battles in there, such as uh, when the Spanish reach the main plaza of Tenochtitlan, um, they set up a you know they very brazenly set up a cannon on top of the main temple, um, but are then um, driven back and have to leave the cannon behind. And but of course you know wonderful the Aztecs now have a cannon but they don't have any they, they, have no they don't have any powder yeah. <laughs> yeah they have no way to use it so they just sink it in the lake yeah. um, <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah and the same thing with crossbows it's actually reports you know there's 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 uh, you know there's a- accounts of you know the Aztecs in taking captured crossbows and you know firing back but you know it, it's it's very un, it's uh, it's unfamiliar weaponry and so yeah, they're, they're yeah. not very well trained with it they don't uh, and, and that, that's the thing with crossbows in general people you get this idea that they're super easy to use and any peasant can use them but then you know yeah, the existence of these um highly highly trained and expensive you know italian crossbow mercenaries and stuff that existed and it's just like well if it was that easy um why are people paying you know stacks <laughs> of gold for other people to actually do it so it sort of gives the lie yeah, to it, that myth i guess that they were yeah, just if, an if, idiot's weapon. Yeah. Yeah. So, but one thing that uh, that the the Aztecs do capture and actually start putting to use is uh, Spanish swords. Although not many are captured, but um, uh, you know, and these are mostly given to the elites. And you know, there's there's these incredulous accounts of uh, from Bernal Diaz del Castillo where you know uh, he sees you know his Spanish countrymen being struck down by their own swords and things like that. Right. Um, and also the swords would be attached to long poles to be used as kind of pole oh, arms yes, against. Yes. Um, horses and they there's also a count of something kind of like like a like a scythe kind of weapon that they would use uh, to attack across barricades so there's you know there's this amazing you know we the typical count is that the that the Aztecs were static and that yeah they were just focused on grabbing prisoners you know and taking them back for sacrifice and while that was an important part of you know their military doctrine it was also you know it over you know kind of underplays the fact that they were having to constantly evolve to to face these threats that were completely alien to them just a few years before and they were doing it quite quickly so with the horses that they would capture they would sacrifice those they wouldn't try and ride them themselves Not yeah well way. most horses weren't really captured most horses were actually killed, killed. yeah okay uh, and that was the way they dealt with it. There's, yeah. uh, there's, a, there's like, there's, exceed, there's an, one exceedingly famous account where, um, uh, in Castillo, where a, uh, someone is is charging him with a with a with a horse, and this is actually when they're still fighting the Tlash Gallons, and with a single blow of a muckle wheat, the horse is basically decapitated. Right. Yes. I always feel for horses in these battles. They always get the the rough end of the pineapple. <laughs> Yes, so it's a pretty famous account, and also kind of uh, showing the, the the effectiveness of the of the Aztec weapons, which actually, you know, they're, they're you know, it's it's said oh, okay, they're just wooden sticks with you know pointy rocks on it, you know, but there are accounts of you know arrows piercing through the breastplates of the Spanish, and uh, the sling stones, of course, you know, do not need to rely on 
you know, when you have a, a perfectly shaped and mass produced ceramic or stone ball flying at yeah. you, at, you know, I have no idea how, things, how fast things stones fast travel, but it's pretty fast. Yeah. Um, yeah. So anyway, there was a, there was a adaptation was going on on both sides. It, you know, the, the Aztecs were quickly having to adapt, and you know, to you know what had been centuries and millennia of kind of uh, Eurasian uh, and Afro Eurasian warfare to kind of adapt these these kind of techniques, and they were doing it very well. But the problem is that Tenochtitlan is a very dense city which could not support itself uh, food wise. It, it was constantly relied on imports. So okay. On, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, and com- even with the you know, the massive wave of smallpox that swept through it, it was still there was there was no food. Um, the Spanish were deliberately targeting um, wells and, and and the aqueducts coming into the city, and so everyone was reduced to drinking brackish water, um, and eating you know lizards and grass and whatever they could find their hands on. So they're they're in this very desperate desperate situation, and the Spanish uh, and their you know thousands of slash gallon allies uh, eventually press into the the main um, central marketplace of Tlatelolco because the Aztecs have now retreated back to the northern half of the city which is of course Tlatelolco as kind of a final last stand uh, and there's kind of a, a brief uh, negotiation um, you know at this point all negotiations on both sides had been rebuffed because both sides basically said hey look you leave yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. no you leave no, you defeat you know you, you, know, you yeah, surrender yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and so there's there's this uh, interesting uh, point where you know uh, kind of a peace tree or you know, peace negotiations open and uh, Qualtomoc specifically makes sure that all the best foods are brought out um, and given to everyone there just to show like uh, you know hey we're yeah, still fine yeah, yeah, we're yeah, still yeah. got plenty of fighting but, us. but it, you know it's a it's a very big show but. yeah and um, the official day um, that the last line of Mexica defenses are broken through is the 13th of August uh, 1521. And at that point, you know, the, there's no place left to withdraw to. And um, in and once again, we see kind of a bifurcated account because in the Spanish version, uh, Cuauhtémoc tries to flee by canoe. Uh, it's not clear where exactly he's fleeing to, but maybe somewhere on the mainland that still, you know, has has allies. Um, but is overtaken by, you know, the Spanish and Tlaxcalan ships and, and brought to uh, uh, Cortes to whom he surrenders. Uh, in the Mexica version, he is actually recognizes that he is um, defeated and is on his way to uh, Cortez to uh, tender his uh, uh, surrender. Okay. Yeah, and um, that is the story that of the is conquest. The story of the conquest. Well, thank you very much for the interview today. It's <laughs> gone on, um, uh, honestly, quite a lot longer than I would have thought. But it's been fantastic. Um, I'll have to have you on again at some other point um, to talk about other aspects of um, Mesoamerican American history. But um, yeah. <laughs> hopefully, something a little more. Continue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it's it's good. I mean, you could always do the Mike Duncan thing and sort of have a two year, a two year, um, two year <laughs> series of weekly podcasts dealing with the history of the empire. Um, anyway, so thank you once again, Four Hundred Rabbits, for for the interview. Um, and when I post up the discussion thread, hopefully you'll be able to answer any follow up questions that people have. Um, Absolutely. And as usual, I mean, this is always one of the, the more popular areas of, of questions that we get on um, on Ask Historians. Um, popular and misunderstood. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Um, and there were aspects which I wanted to cover too, but we didn't we didn't get to. But um, that'll be for another time. Um, so yes, thank you very much, um, and hopefully we'll see you around on Ask Historians. You've been listening to the Ask Historians podcast. For more history like this visit us at reddit.com slash r slash askhistorians and ask over a hundred historians and enthusiasts anything you want to know in history. Find us on Twitter as at askhistorians and subscribe to the show on iTunes. Or visit askhistorians.libsyn.com Thank you very much for listening and join us next time on the Ask Historians podcast.